I almost say the impossible just takes a little longer. <laughs> you know, it's funny. The definition of a really good patent, every patent, think about this, every patent was once considered impossible, right? Yeah. The airplane, the light bulb. I mean, think of all those great pat great inventions was once that considered impossible. So sometimes the wild idea, you say, you put it down, you look at it, and you say, oh, that's impossible. And then you, then you think about it and you say, well, if you did A, B, and C, maybe I could make it happen. And we've done that a lot in our career. Let's discover the Cleveland entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are telling the stories of its entrepreneurs and those supporting them. Welcome to the Lay of the Land podcast, where we are exploring what people are building in Cleveland. I am your host, Jeffrey Stern, and today I had the honor of speaking with John Nottingham of Nottingham Spur. If you have ever used a Swiffer Sweepback, a Crest Spin Brush, a Dirt Devil, a Jacuzzi, a Little Tykes Playhouse, Duct Tape, Smart Mouth Mouthwash, an Axe Bullet, a Sherwin-Williams Twist and Pour Paint Container, and so on, you have used one of their inventions. Nottingham Spurk is a Cleveland-based product innovation firm responsible for these worldwide product platforms and many more, and is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Since founding the company in 1972 on Case Western Reserve University's campus, John and his co-founder and partner John Spurk have led their team of innovators to create hundreds of breakthrough products, resulting in over 1,350 issued patents and counting more than Thomas Edison. Although Nottingham Spurk started in a garage on the campus of Case Western, they now operate the 66,000 square foot Nottingham Spurk Innovation Center a mile and a half from their original location. With teams dedicated to insights, product design, engineering, prototyping, digital design, and commercialization, the projects and ideas stay within those walls until market launch. This was a true pleasure of a conversation. Really amazing to hear John's stories and reflections on building some of the most ubiquitous products while building a firm with such a commitment to the creative process and to innovation. Please enjoy my conversation with John Nottingham. In prepping for this conversation today, it became very clear to me how much creativity and, and innovation you you have and are contributing to this world, albeit a little behind the scenes uh, or outside of the main spotlight, if you will. And so very happy to to be a spotlight for for you here and, and to shed a light on some of, I think, the really incredible work that you've done here in Cleveland and, and over the past 50 years and, and continue to do so today. So thank you for taking the time and coming on to share your story. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, so I'd love if, we could start if you just take us back and give us kind of the history here of how Nottingham Spur got started. I, I know it transpired right here in Cleveland uh, in a garage, perhaps on the campus of, of Case Western, <laughs> but maybe just take us through how it came to be and a little bit of that, that founding story. Well, I came to Cleveland to go to the Cleveland Institute of Arts Industrial Design Program. Originally, I, would, I wanted to design cars. And this, it's one of the best car design schools in the country. John Spurk also came there at the same time. We met in line at registration in the freshman year. Interesting. And uh, we went through the five-year program together. Originally, we competed with each other. And we decided, hey, we're, we can do more together than we can competing. So we started working together right, right at school. And when we graduated, we both assumed we'd get corporate job offers and move out of Cleveland. And I got the job offer from General Motors, and John got the job offer from Huffy, and we turned it down. And we found a garage and started a company. And it's that simple. <laughs> why, why did you do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> we thought that as, a, as an independent innovation company, we could have a bigger effect than working with any, whether it's General Motors or Huffy or any place. One company, we felt we could work with lots of companies and we never went back. We started and that's all we've ever done in our career. 
So I think we'll we'll spend a lot of time in our conversation here talking about innovation. And I, I think it's always helpful just to for for everyone tuning in and, and for ourselves to have a, a shared understanding of of what that actually means. And so I, I'd love if you could just describe what what innovation means to you. Because I'm a product designer, I started out as a product designer, the innovation in our world tends to be devices. But it goes beyond that. It goes to business model. It goes to a lot of things. But let's just talk about devices. And when you talk about devices, one of the things you think about is patents, right? Mm, yeah. So we have, uh, when we work with companies, we have co-created now 1,350 patents, 1,350. To give you a little perspective, another Ohioan by the name of Thomas Edison had 1,093, so we passed him a few years ago. Another interesting statistic when we talk about innovation, if you got a patent today, it's, it starts with the number 10 million, but only 5% ever get commercialized. If you Google mm-hmm. it, you look up, hey, how many, how many, what percentage of patents get commercialized? It's 5%. So... What Nottingham Spurk has done over the years, we've created this process we call vertical innovation, vertically integrated innovation. Using that process, we've created 1,350 patents, 95% are commercialized. That's the difference. It's a huge difference. Wow. Maybe if you can just unpack what vertical innovation means, what is entailed in that? Okay. Well, let me start at the beginning. Everybody, I don't care who you are, if you're an innovator, right? You start at the beginning with a, a, a pain point, maybe an opportunity, something. You have an idea, right? And everybody wants to commercialize it because if it's not commercialized, what good is it? But here's the problem. The reason only 5% of U.S. patents get commercialized is innovation is typically done in silos. Think about it. There's a group that has an innovation. They do a creative session. They throw that over the over uh, over the wall or over the uh, silo into into market research. Let's have a market. Let's see if the market wants it. So the market market research will do a study, and they'll put that in a binder, right? And they'll throw that over the silo into uh, a design group, and a design group will do some concepts, and they'll throw that over the wall to engineers will try to figure out if they can make this thing and they'll engineer it and they'll throw that over the wall to a prototyper who will do a proof of concept prototype and they'll throw that over the wall back to the engineering to design it uh, for manufacturing throw that over the wall another step of concepting another step step of prototyping throw that over the wall to supply chain throw that over the wall to digital design and throw that over the wall to commercialization and you wonder why 5% 5% ever get commercialized. <laughs> and there's none of the silos talk to each other very much. There's friction between the silos. And that's why it's only 5%. Now, let me tell you the difference between for vertical innovation. It's vertically integrated innovation. If you look at our facility here, it was a, it was a Christian science church. It's, it's uh, 60,000 square feet. We have a vertically integrated staff and physically we're vertically integrated. We have five floors. This is the difference with vertical innovation. And I use the analogy of an SUV. Let's say we have an SUV at the starting point where everybody else starts, but we want to end all the way down the road to commercialization. When we start with the SUV, we have a project manager who's driving the SUV. But in the seats, we have somebody from insights, design, engineering, prototyping, digital design, supply chain, commercialization, all in the SUV. We also have enough gas in the SUV to get from where we start all the way to the commercialization before we even start. And we have a GPS on how to get there. And we don't start unless all of those things are are decided upon, including Decisions have to be made in 24 to 48 hours. I'm not going to wait for three months for a decision. Not going to happen. So when we're all aligned, the project manager puts their foot on the gas, and we start going up the hill, up the hill. We go through 
We start with we start with we start with uh, insights. We go to market research. We go to we go to design, engineering, prototyping, back to engineering, uh, proof of concept, design for manufacturing, supply chain, all the way to commercialization. And ninety five percent of them get to commercialization. That's the difference. It's a huge difference. When you were starting the firm, did did you have a founding vision that painted a semblance of the picture of what the firm looks like today with 1,300 patents, 95% commercialized, and this whole concept of vertical innovation? Or, or how, how did you come to this philosophy? We came to it by pure need, okay? <laughs> we had to prove ourselves, right? So an early version of, of vertical innovation had to be done. We were scrappy, we got there, and uh, we, we really had some interesting times from, from the very beginning. And sitting here today, doing what I do today, it's not that different than what I did when we first started with those two people. We did everything. Now I've got you know 75 people that can do some other things that actually I can't do very well, and I'm, <laughs> I'm thrilled that they can do it, that I can't, especially special, you know, biomedical engineering and fluid dynamics and uh, prototyping and rapid prototyping and digital and, and electronics. I have a smattering of all that, but I'm sure glad I have all these experts that can do, seamlessly do all the stuff we need to have done. What was, in your reflection, you know, the first big break of the firm? Well, so remember, here's John and John, freshly minted, find a garage, I turned down General Motors, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> so here we are in this garage that we're renting in the Case Western Reserve campus, right? So what do you do? You got no money. You got no contacts. You got no nothing, right? So you got a telephone. You're dialing for dollars. You know, you just go back and you're dialing, you're calling, you're writing letters. Nobody would give us the time of day except one. Long story short, we got, we got a connection with a little company in Macedonia called Rotodyne. Now, Rotodyne was a, um, a rotational molder. And I remember the guy, the president of the company said, you know, I walked in and he said, well, what do you know about rotational molding? I said, everything. Oh, okay, then he's just started. Uh, on the way back, I, I said to John Spurk, I said, we gotta be real quick studies on, on rotational molding. We learned, <laughs> we learned everything we could find about Rotational mold. Now, let me tell you what it is. You have a steel uh, cast aluminum mold. You open it up. You pour in uh, what's typically polyethylene plastic. You close. You clamp it down. You start to rotate it. And you go into a heater, and it melts the plastic. The plastic coats the inside of the uh, aluminum, and then it goes into a chiller, and it, and it chills it. And we open it up. You have a hollow uh, plastic part, like a barrel. Right, you know, an industrial, you know, these Jersey burials, the, the, the barricades they they uh, talk about in the streets. Those are rotational molded, mostly industrial. Well, this company, Rotodyne, was doing bed pans for the hospital supply industry, rotationally molded bed pans. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to call my parents that just paid <laughs> to have me go five years to college knowing that I turned down General Motors to tell them I'm going to do a bedpan. I'm not going to make that call. I'm not. I'm not. But if you look at a bedpan and you put four wheels on it and a roof, it becomes a little car, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and long story short, that became Little Tykes. Rotodyne changed their name to Little Tykes. That little $1 million company grew to $600 million. We started doing, I designed the logo for Little Tux by hand. And we did, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of products and helped them grow. So that was probably the first big break. Not too bad. That's incredible. One of the, I, there, are, there are a lot of strings I want to pull on here, but maybe to start, and I don't know if it is attention from your perspective, but new product development versus improving things that already exist. Right. Right. Like the conventional wisdom that I always hear is to not reinvent the wheel, but it appears this is precisely what you have done and have done quite successfully for a very long time. 
Well, you know, most companies we that we interact with have a wonderful core business, their core product. That's their bread and butter. That's what they have to concentrate on. That's what happens that you know next quarter they got to make their numbers. They got to deal with their customers. I get it. I've got the luxury of interacting with that with that company that's doing the core to do what's called adjacent and disruptive and breakthrough innovation while they're doing their core. And best practice is that you should do both. Most companies aspire to do both, but the problem is they spend so much time on their core. On a Thursday, they'll go out and do a they'll go out and do a, a, a creative session to do new things. Everybody get all excited. They'll have a hundred ideas. They'll put it in a binder, and then on Friday they come back to work, and their 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 customer had a hiccup, and everybody gets sucked back into the core. I've got the luxury in our group to think outside that proverbial box and do something different, and that's what we've done our whole career. How do you maintain that culture of and commitment to innovation? Because from afar, I think one of the pitfalls of standing companies is a general complacency that kind of sits in over time where it's that over maybe commitment to focus on the core where they lose that culture of innovation that maybe spurred them to the peaks that many of those companies now try and build moats around. And it's, it's now about preventing others from ascending rather than like trying to continue that climb. So how, how have you both internally as a, as a company um, and also with the clients that you work with, foster this this culture of of innovation, where you challenge yourself. It starts with the environment itself. You know, when we when we were outgrowing our facilities, when we were looking uh, for a new new place, rather than look for a loft or an office building or an industrial park, we found a church of all things. Why would you do that? Well, church architecture is designed for inspiration right? It's designed to think beyond yourself. When you go into a church, you're like, oh my God, you look at the high ceiling. In our case, you look at our rotunda, our oculus. You want to do something great. You really do in that environment. And then you encourage, you encourage your staff to always be thinking about new things, thinking about the customer, thinking about creating new things and build a culture that you're always questioning. And this whole Vertical innovation idea means that everybody everybody works as a unit. You have a project manager, but you but the man, the they're they're talking to designers and engineers and insights and biomedical engineers and all those those people that are that are going to have one goal. That goal is commercialization. We're all working to the goal all the time, every time. The other thing is most of our people are working on two or three projects at the same time. So when one kind of you're waiting for a decision, you, sh- you, you shift to another and they're all, it's, it's very organic. There, there are groups, there's teams of, you might be on one team for one project and another team on another project. And you're always mixing it up. It's always a variety. You're always doing something. Well, one of the things we don't do is get bored. There's boredom is not around <laughs> for sure. Sometimes I say I skip in in the morning and I crawl out at night. That's how I feel. I'm physically and mentally exhausted by the end of the day. Now you caught me. You caught me at the end of the day. I'm still doing okay, but I'll crawl out of here when I'm done. How does the the creative process work? I think it would be really interesting to hear from like soups to nuts. Take us through an innovation process. What does each step kind of look like? Um, and, and what are what are the kinds of questions that that you're asking a, along the way? Well, early on, okay. Here's the thing: you got to start with the customer. It's not. I'm not designing a product for me necessarily. I'm designing for some customer. So we bring our customers into our place, and we and we talk to them. What is your desires? What are your pain points? What are your issues? You know, look at the products you have in front of you. Are they satisfying you or is there something else? So we start there. We start there really looking at those pain points. And then we have a series of what we call creative sessions. One session is, uh, I call it the uh, diverging session. 
You start with that pain point, start with the opportunity. Now you diverge what, what, in, in ideas that I call mild to wild. Now mild is, you know, here's a product, here's an incremental improvement. Okay, I get that. Now, once I've done that, what is the most wild thing you can think of? Forget the technology, forget if it could even be done. If you could just have any, wave your magic wand and you could create the most wild thing you could, put it down and let's see that. Now you got mild to wild and everything in between. And now you have 27 different ideas in between. So that's diverging. And, you, and if, if you're not careful, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of ideas. Well, then you're exhausted. You know, you're crawling out you're exhausted. <laughs> the team is exhausted. Oh, by the way, there's no bad ideas. You're in a group, you're thinking thoughts. Nobody can shoot down anybody's ideas. Everybody, if, if it's worth saying or putting down or, or identifying, it's a good idea. There's no bad ideas in that session, in the diverging session. You want as many ideas as possible. You don't care how practical you are. You don't care. It's levitating, it's, uh, it's augmented reality. Whatever it is, you put it down. Now, then you're done, all right? You, you, you stop. The next session, you revisit it. Now you go to the converging session. Now, you can't do 500 ideas, you're gonna do three. So how do you make it down to three? Well, you have, you have a funneling process that gets it down to the three best. And then you, you go from there. So that's kind of, that's kind of how you, you get these, uh, you, you get the creative process, diverging, converging. How often is the wildest idea the best idea? You know what? Every once in a while, the wildest idea is the one that gets there. You know, you, well, I always say the impossible just takes a little longer. <laughs> you know, it's funny. The definition of a really good patent, every patent, think about this. Every patent was once considered impossible, right? Yeah. The airplane, the light bulb. I mean, think of all those great pat great inventions was once considered impossible. So sometimes the wild idea, you say, you put it down, you look at it, and you say, oh, that's impossible. And then you, then you think about it and you say, well, if you did A, B, and C, maybe I could make it happen. And we've done that a lot in our career. I'll tell you one way. I'll tell you one when we did. Sure. So we looked at electric toothbrushes. All electric toothbrushes at the time we looked at, it, Sonicare and others, were $50, $100. So let's go mild or wild. And long story short, we said, what if we could commercialize a really great electric toothbrush for $5 retail? Impossible, right? At the okay. time. <laughs> because we went to the customer and we found that a critical price wall was $5 retail. Now, what does that mean? Well, the retailer set it for $5, but the retailer wants to pay half $250. And we wanted to have a factory cost of $125. Everybody wants a 50% markup. So I go back to my engineers and I say, we're going to do this toothbrush. But we got to land. We got to have this made for for you know a buck twenty five. Now they're looking at me like I'm cross eyed. You can't do that. Why not? Well, let's do the bill of materials. Let's look at the motor. Okay. Well, what does a motor cost? Well, they look in their catalog and they get a Mabuchi motor, and the Mabuchi motor is you know a dollar fifty. You want to take this from dollar twenty five? Well, how are you going to do that? Well. Let's look at the Mizushi motor. Let's take it apart. Why is it so expensive? It's the copper. We don't need that much copper to move a, a, a bristle. Let's just wind just enough copper. Let's do our own motor and put it back together. We went to a motor manufacturer and we said, good news. We want to buy a million motors for 14 cents. And they looked at his cross side and they hemmed it up. We, they figured it out. They, we, gave, we got motors for 14 cents. What's the next, what's the next uh, you know, most costly thing? It's the batteries. What do batteries cost? What does a branded alkaline battery cost? Wholesale, 18, 18 cents at the time. 
we did a reverse internet auction. We got the price down to eight and a half cents. Mm. And we, we did that for, for the switch, for the bristles, for everything. We ended up landing this thing for $1.25. We launched a product. We started a company called the Dr. John Spin Brush Company. I'm John. And John Burke is John. And John Osher is John. And, you know, Larry Blaustein got outvoted. And uh, <laughs> we started a company called Dr. John Spin Brush Company. And we invented the best-selling toothbrush in the world. We have sold almost a billion of them. We sold the company to Procter & Gamble. They put the Crest name on it. They sold hundreds of, of, of millions of units. And when they acquired Oral-B, they sold that to um, Arm & Hammer. Now it's the Arm & Hammer Spin Brush. You could go to any drugstore, any store in the world, and buy a Spin Brush. And I encourage all the people listening in to go buy a Spin Brush. It's the greatest <laughs> product. And it's still like seven bucks. So that's the impossible. It's impossible to do a five dollar electric toothbrush until it isn't. You see what I'm saying? I do see what you're saying. How often do you get pushback against pushing the boundary of what people think is impossible? Like how many of the ideas that came since then have have involved someone saying, ah, oh, it, it can't be done? See, part of the vertical innovation process is having choices, right? So you have options and you start, you started going, you know, you, you diverge, converge, diverge, converge, and you always get to a solution 95% of the time. I don't have that problem because we always have a process to get around it. What does the decision-making process look like as you're filtering you know, the ideas down to a smaller convergence set? How much of it is, is your own gut and intuition? How much of it is quantifiable and measurable and tangibles? How do you balance these things? You know, it all depends on, on the problem you're solving. I mean, sometimes it's a technological problem and you have to have the engineers or you have to have subject matter experts coming in and really help you. It really depends. I mean, we're doing a lot of, right now we're doing a lot of medical devices and mm. medical devices have to, I mean, we're saving lives. We're literally saving lives with some of these things. It's awesome. We're doing clinical trials. We're doing, I mean, you know, it's, it's all a part of that process. And, you know, it, you just, it's just get it done. You just grind it out, get it done, and commercialize 95% of it. How do you, I guess, deal with, with failed innovations or, or projects that didn't meet the intended outcome? Well, okay. Failure is built into the system. It's part of the vetting process. By yeah. the time you get to commercialization, those failures are like way back down uh, in the, the beginning. I mean, the early concepts, the early things, you know, they try them, they fail, you move. But once you get through the vertical innovation process, the winners succeed. And again, you can't argue with 95%. And so what, what kind of allows you to persist through the time that it takes to arrive at the successful outcome of the vertical innovation process? Like as a firm, what are the kind of guardrails that maybe it's like you have the financial runway to be able to take some, some risks and, and, and go through that process. But how, how have you thought about what allows you to, to surmount those failures along the way and achieve that level of success? It's all part of it. So, uh, you know, uh, a vertical innovation pr uh, a project is typically 12 to 18 months. And if it's a medical product because of, you know, clinical trial, it, it can extend further. But um, we know what it takes. I mean, we know how long it takes. We know along the way we're going to have fits and starts and, and we'll have challenges. We'll have obstacles to jump over. And we just meet those. I mean, we just, we just do it. And uh, where we start, where we end up, sometimes where we end up is different than what we started because we went down some different paths and had some different challenges or opportunities we came, came along or we found a new technology. Whatever it is, we get there. And we get there and we get the commercialization. And when you get to commercialization, you have a real product in a real person's hand that are paying real money that create real business. And that's, that's, that's what it's all about. Hmm. As you reflect on the last 50 years of, of the firm, what, what are the things that you have learned and, and believe today that 
uh, you didn't anticipate? Just having been involved in innovation specifically, technologically, the world has really changed quite drastically in that time. So I'm curious, like, what are the things that surprised you uh, that you didn't see coming and just some reflections on the journey? Yeah, it's funny. It almost seems like my career has been a vertical innovation process. <laughs> I mean, I've, you know, it's changed. It's evolved. It's gone on. It's not a whole lot. My brain is not a whole lot different from when I started till today. I'm still doing the same things. I'm still, on, I'm still, you know, solving people's problems, trying to, you know, innovate and, and move forward. It doesn't seem that much different. I mean, I've learned, but it's part of that process. It's it's incremental. Uh, I, I I come in every day, go out every day, and I've, I learn some. Listen, I learn something every single day when I'm here, including today. Yeah. When you think about the future of of the firm and just how much you've accomplished, you know, on par with with Edison's output in, in some capacities and a better commercialization rate, like how, how do you think about the longevity of of the nature of your doing and kind of the the culture of the firm that that will allow that innovation to continue going forward? Um, and on top of that, I'm just curious, like what what is, are you most excited about? thinking about the the future? Well, you know, um, it's getting more technical. It's getting more technological. The, the technologies we're using are, are more advanced. But, you know, that's happened my whole career. I mean, we've added, you know, right. it's, it's, it's just gone that way. Uh, what it does do is it allows us to, uh, to affect more people. And really, it's more digital. It's more connected. It's more broad. But it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It keeps on going. It's relentless. It's it's absolutely relentless. And the more people come in, we're hiring some unbelievable talent. Unbelievable talent. Both homegrown. Some we have a great internship program with some of the engineers and design schools, but we we recruit from uh, experienced people from all over the country, frankly. And uh, they're coming here. And they're they're assimilating into our vertical innovation process. They think. You know, they died and went to heaven because it's so <laughs> cool to kind of think about. It's just, it's just, it's, I am fascinated. You know, I jump in the car. I'm still thinking about stuff. I wake up in the morning. I'm still thinking about stuff. My wife says, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? Think about that. But it's, it's who I am. You know, you live it and it's who I am. It's just what I do all day, every day. It doesn't stop. I'm on vacation. I'm still thinking. It's, it's what I do. How much of what you've established with the, this concept of vertical innovation is reproducible elsewhere? Do, do you, like, how do you think about competition in, in that way? Or is it a philosophy that, that more people should just be practicing um, and there should be more of it? You know, I tell anybody who will listen, I've, I've made, you know, I've, I've, I have a, a TED talk that I've done on it. I've uh, written articles. I've done... People come in here, I tell them, listen, this is our secret sauce, right? You know <laughs> right. what? It's, it's easy to say, it's hard to do. Most companies that I know of, and there's some great companies out there, let me tell you, but most of them do a part of vertical innovation. Some of them do really good on the front end, design, and concept, and everything else. Some others do really good well on the back end, supply chain, and all that other stuff. I have never seen anybody do it from start, to, from beginning to end, the way we do it. I just have, I, I've never seen it set up. Oh, I've said it once, just once, and which kind of gave me the uh, inspiration of this. Pixar Studios. I, mm. you know, about 20 or 30, no, 20 years ago, yeah, maybe a little longer, I had the benefit of going through Pixar. There's a great book written, I think it's called Innovation Inc. about Pixar. You know, Steve Jobs, that was his that was his baby. They in fact they call it the they call it the Steve Jobs building in San Francisco. And what is it? Well, it is a an atrium. They'll they'll tell you about this. They, there's an atrium in the center, okay? And they put the restrooms on one side, they put the cafeteria on the other side, they stack the floors around it. They put all, you know, in Pixar they have the writers and the animators and the voice of everybody is in that building. And Steve Jobs talked about this. It's designed that 
During the day, people bump into each other in the hallway, in that atrium, and on purpose. And because creativity is a mix of formal sessions and informal sessions, and they all work together and they are vertically integrated. They do as close to vertical innovation as I've ever seen any company. And mm -hmm. look at their track record. I mean, I never saw the statistics, but I'll bet you 95% of their movies are successful. And I don't know any other company that can say that. So that's the one benchmark that I'll give you. So it, if the secret sauce ultimately then is in the, the execution of vertical innovation, what, what makes it so difficult to, to emulate in its entirety? Well, first of all, you have to have the environment. And after I saw Pixar, uh, we found this, this church that has a central, uh, a central rotunda stacked yeah. right around. We bump into each other during the day. Does this sound familiar? We actually physically designed it around the Pixar environment. So that's one. And then you have to have a staff that's diverse, that diverse in, in culture, diverse in what you can do your background and everything else, you put them all together vertically integrated and you have to you have to do it in a vertically integrated way. I just haven't seen anybody do it. Maybe they'll will, you know, but yeah. I've been working on it for decades and you know I'm still I'm still tweaking it. So you know, let them catch up. I, I do have a follow-up on that. I'm just curious your perspective. I mean obviously in the last two years societally we've been pushed a little bit in a direction where Remote is more of an option, uh, maybe even prescribed in, in some situations. And I, I personally have found it a little difficult to, to have that kind of unplanned interaction with people at work where the nature of hopping on a Zoom call is very transactional. How have you navigated that as a company? And, and what, are, what are your thoughts on, on kind of remote work? Well, look here. So we make things, right? We're doing we're yeah. doing a prototype. You cannot phone in a prototype. I'm, let me tell you. Right. <laughs> so during the entire during the entire pandemic, the majority of us were here. The ones that have to build the prototypes and do the kind of thing and interaction. Most of our staff was here because, first of all, we were doing we were doing medical devices. We're doing fat. We've had we've had the FDA give us. Breakthrough status in some of these medical mm -hmm. devices. We're fast tracking medical devices through the pandemic, some of which are solving the pandemic issues, like which I could talk to you about. So we didn't stop. We were here. Now, the, some of the staff through the pandemic that, you know, in insights and other things, you know, they, they worked some, some of them were work remotely or some hybrid, you know, back and forth. The vast majority were here, including me. And then your, your thoughts on if you can have that environment in a remote world, just the, that level of creativity and inspiration that comes from those unplanned interactions. Well, you know, it, it's like we, we talked about, you know, this, this was sort of leveled on us. But, you know, we have used, you know, these Zoom calls and other things. And uh, I'm finding that <laughs> in some cases we'll be in two parts of this building and we'll just do a Zoom call rather than go to a conference room. So <laughs> this hybrid thing, you know, this hybrid thing is, is not all bad. You know, there's some, there's some efficiencies built into it. We're doing, uh, we, you know, we have a number of venture companies that we've co-founded and we are uh, on the board of directors of a lot of these things. And our board meetings, rather than, you know, we've got one company in, uh, on the West Coast and four times a year, we'd have to, you know, fly out there and get hotel rooms and go to the board meeting. Well, now, uh, you know, maybe two or three of those board meetings will, will be right like this, right on Zoom. You know, as nice as it is to be there, you know, it's nice to have this, this thing. So we're, listen, this is part of our system. Hey, listen, if, if Zoom calls are efficient and so forth, hey, build it into the system. I don't care. How, how often are those ideas homegrown, I guess, emerging from within the firm versus from a client that you're working with? Like how often are you spinning up companies versus bringing in customers? You know, the vast majority are customers. And people say, well, do people come to you with an idea or whatever? You know, it's, there's no, there's, everyone's different. 
Most of them, we have a client partner. Even in the, the companies we start, we usually have a private equity or family office that where we have, you know, we, we combine, you know, the funding with the, with the whole vertical innovation process. And uh, it, it's usually collaborative some way. It, you know, we don't have all the answers. We really don't. But we, we collaborate with our client partners. And I don't care where the idea comes from. And when we apply for the patents, the true inventors who on that patent, sometimes it's some of us, sometimes it's one of our client partners. We put on, you know, we'll have, you know, two or three or four inventors on each patent. And I don't really care as long as we get the patent going in the right direction. I'd love if you could just take us through maybe a few of your other favorite projects, most impactful that, that you've worked on. Oh, my I mean, there's so many of them. There's, I, if you go to thousands. our website, go to our website, <laughs> take a look. I mean, there are dozens and dozens and dozens, you know, from medical devices to consumer products to industrial products. Uh, the process is the same in a way. Gosh, the medical products are game changing. We're doing a, a blood testing device. We've licensed, we've licensed the original technology from Case Western Reserve. We found a group of scientists there, brilliant, that use physics instead of chemistry to test blood. What does that mean? Well, you don't have to get antigens from China because it's solid state. You're using a laser. So when we got it, it, it was the size of a conference room. It used gold to, uh, to use on their electronics. I mean, it, was, it worked, it proved feasibility, but it was impractical at that point. We had to take it from the conference table size thing to a handheld device. We have a little thing called a clot chip. We got it down to $3 cost. You have a drop of blood, you whip the blood, you stick it in our handheld machine, and you find out digitally whether your blood is too thick or too thin. So when you're taking blood thinners like Eliquis, Pradaxa, or Xeralto, you want to know if your blood is if you're if you're taking too much, you're going to bleed out. If you take don't take enough, you're going to have a uh, you're going to have a, a stroke or a clot. And so these are things that are saving lives. We we were we were given we were given fast track status from the FDA. Everybody's excited about this thing. It's really going to change blood testing in the world. I mean, that's just one of twenty things I can talk about. Right. Right. Through the pandemic, we, 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 we uh, started with another technology from uh, Cornell. It was test done in Cornell that is looking at, at uh, disinfection. Hospital-acquired infection is a huge problem in hospitals. Two and a half million people get an infection in a hospital that they didn't have when they walked in. A hundred thousand people die of hospital-acquired infection. Three times the amount of auto accidents. Wow, that is that is alarming. <laughs> it's, all, it's very alarming. Yeah, it's it's like a, a, a you know a jumbo jet crashing every week. I mean, it's horrible. Anyway, jeez. So one of the things, if you take a look at a, at a cell phone, everybody that works in the hospital brings a cell phone in and uses the cell phone and takes it home. Well, what if you have C diff on that cell phone? What if you have COVID on that cell phone? How do you uh, disinfect it? Well, I'll tell you what the hospitals are doing today. You take a tub of uh, wipes, disinfecting wipes, you pull the wipes out, and you got to rub this thing for four minutes. That's what you do. Now, how many people do you think do it? Four One minutes. One percent, right? That's, a, that's more than most attention spans these days. <laughs> okay. So our technology is, is now the size of a microwave, and it's got a little tub of hydrogen peroxide combined with cold plasma, a technology. You put your cell phone in, you close the door, five to 10 minutes, it's totally disinfected, doesn't harm the electronics, doesn't harm the environment. You can put your stethoscope in, your, your name tag, your, your pen, anything that might get infected, you put it in there. Mm -hmm. It saves each one of these little tubs of hydrogen peroxide, uh, saves 44 canisters of wipes that are not biodegradable, that are land up in landfills. That's just got just a couple of weeks ago, got EPA approval. As soon as we got EPA approval, we had 27 hospital systems 
order these things. Wow. I mean, this is going to change disinfection in the world. Think about it. Yeah, no, it's it's incredible. <laughs> Another technology we started again. These are companies we co-founded. Another yeah. thing. Do you ever know anybody with a with a concussion? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. The therapy for concussion. First of all, there isn't any therapy other than sit in a room for thirty days. That's that's what you're supposed to, inactivity for thirty days. We have a device that we've designed. We're going through a large clinical trial right now. It's called therapy around your carotid artery and around your head. It's a little device that cools down the brain. So let's say, let's say you have a you have a concussion go off off the football field. The trainer puts this on for thirty minutes, okay, and then within forty eight hours puts another thirty minute session, and the recovery is three days, not thirty days. Wow! This will be the first this summer. This will be the first FDA approved therapy for concussions in the world. It will be standard of care for concussions. It'll be best practice for concussions in the world. You will hear about it. So those are three of my 20 things I could talk about. Yeah, no, thank you for, for sharing those. Not too shabby. <laughs> are, are you drawn to any industries more so than others? Or is it more just this love of the process and... You know, I love the process. I love solving problems. We started out in consumer. Uh, we've migrated very heavily in the medical. We've got biomedical engineers that will, you know, are brilliant. We're doing a lot of industrial things, really, you know, but, you know, being grounded in consumer, what is a consumer? You have to be innovative, you have to be low cost, and you have to, you have to please the customer. Well, medical is the same way. Really, industrial is the same way. Everybody's got a customer. So, it really doesn't matter the industry. It matters, you know, the opportunity and um, the wherewithal to do it. Well, I want to maybe bookend our, our conversation here. I have a closing question for everyone, but I, I also just want to kind of ask if any any other reflections or, or parting wisdom um, that that you have for for the audience or just just wow. thoughts on the journey so far. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just excited about the next fifty years. Okay, I, I don't know how how long I'll be able to uh, participate in the next 50 years, as long as I could, right? But if I've seen all this in the last 50 years, what's gonna happen in the next 50 years? Holy cow. But we are set up to do some really, really, really wonderful things. That's very exciting. And I know you're, you're doing a lot of work here in, in Cleveland as well. Oh yeah. You have the, the EY Innovation Hub and things of that nature. I mean, if, you, if you'd like to speak to that, I would love to hear a little bit about that before we, we wrap up. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, I love being in Cleveland because we're, you know, we're not Silicon Valley, but we're Manufacturing Valley. We've got a great legacy of manufacturing. And right now, most factories are what we call factory 3.0. In the next 10 years, there'll be two types of factories. Ones that will go to 4.0, in other words, digitization, digital twin, and, and connectivity of all their, all their machines in the factory, or they'll be out of business. It'll be one or the other. And we, are, we have companies every day coming in here talking about, you know, how, how can we get to that next level? And, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can take your old equipment and, and you can digitize it. You can you can put you can pair it with with uh, with with connectivity, and you can do it right now. You don't have to wipe out your factory to go to you know brand new thing. So we're working with a lot of new people, and it makes sense to be a clue. It doesn't mean we we would never be in Silicon Valley. First of all, the cost of living is too high. Second of all, they don't have the supply chain. They don't have the infrastructure that we have in Cleveland. So it's perfect to be a clue. I wouldn't be anywhere else. Perfect segue for our closing question, which is not necessarily for your favorite thing in Cleveland, but for something that other people may not know about, a hidden gem. You know what? I'm going to say it sounds too obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway, that I think the Cleveland Clinic, and I'll tell you why. I'm on the board. I've been on the board of the Cleveland Clinic for 20 years, and it's world class. I mean, there is nothing better than the Cleveland Clinic. It's so good, it's going to get better. I just had a board meeting yesterday, and we're going to open up in London. 
the Abu Dhabi is just going great facility uh, through California, uh, Las Vegas. I mean, we're just starting. I mean, there's just the Clip Clinic is so good. It's going to it's going to change healthcare more than people think. It's on steroids. I, that's that's my and it's not it's not like a hidden gem. It's it's like no, yeah, the bar is already very high for the clinic. I'm saying that it's, <laughs> that it's still hidden. You know, there's way way bigger mountains to climb for the Cleveland Clinic. We benchmarked that. It's best practice. It's best in the world. And I'm just thrilled to be on a world-class board. Oh, amazing. Well, John, I, uh, again, really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story today. It's absolutely fascinating to hear about the, the work you're doing and, and the process. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. If folks have anything they would like to follow up with you about, what is the best way for them to do so? Just DM him on it. Uh, uh, Jay Nottingham at NottinghamSpurk.com. Easy. Awesome. Well, thank you again, John. Okay. Thank you. Take care. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. So if you have any feedback, please send over an email to jeffrey at layoftheland.fm or find us on Twitter at podlayoftheland or at sternhefe, J-E-F-E. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please reach out as well and let us know. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast player. Your support goes a long way to help us spread the word and continue to bring the Cleveland founders and builders we love having on the show. We'll be back here next week at the same time to map more of the land. The Lay of the Land podcast was developed in collaboration with the Up Company LLC. At the time of this recording, unless otherwise indicated, we do not own equity or other financial interests in the company which appear on the show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.